All right, here we are. Welcome to the real stream, for real this time. Originally, it was delayed because I had forgotten to take my medicine. Uh, the wound care, like changing a wound dressing alone takes about two hours, doing it by myself. And then taking uh, my medicine, plus I got to do shots. Uh, that takes about 20 minutes. So we were delayed there. And then we were delayed for a number of uh, technical problems. Those seem to be straightened out. So let's finally get going. So you can see I've accomplished quite a bit off stream. This is looking pretty nice, I must say so. So I took all the bitmap masks that I had created in the project using just the core mesh. And I carried those over into this project with the semi-complete mesh. Basically, we have one instance of everything that's going to be instantiated. So for example, this plate, there's going to be probably three or four more of them. But I don't want to have to draw the threads, uh, you know, color in the threads or create the masks. Oh, hey, Return of the Stoic. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I've put a lot of time and effort into this. So, yeah, I didn't want to have to create masks for each and every thread more times than was necessary. So in the final version, this armor plate will be replicated, instantiated three or four more times. Uh, same thing with these down here. As a set, they'll carry all the way around the waist as well. So that's where we're at. A um, couple of things that didn't, the maps didn't render right. Actually, you can't see the problem now, but Previously, the ambient occlusion created this huge, like, weird stain here. Um, it's not visible now, so maybe it's not a problem. But obviously, there's another weird stain here, too. Basically, uh, this is going to have to be recreated in its own project in which I use a cage mesh. So either the high poly or the low poly here is too thin that the rays aren't bouncing off stuff right so you gotta work you gotta use a cage mesh so uh yeah we're gonna get that done there's really not too much left i want to do with this um i think it's a very good mix mix of being highly detailed but also not cluttered and i think Obviously, being highly detailed, that's just a matter of, you know, working in all the details that you possibly can. But in terms of it not then looking like it's visually cluttered, a lot of that is due to the color scheming. Um, it's basically black and red and gold and silver, and that's about it. So... Uh, I want to do some, I want to create some wear generation on the edges of stuff. For example, the belt, I want that to look a little more worn and maybe add a little bit of wear to some of the armor. Uh, but other than that, all that's really left to do is what I've been kind of dreading is more of these knot works. So... Originally, I tried to create ID maps in ZBrush. And you can kind of see the, the difference between the ones that were created procedurally and the ones here that were drawn in by hand. Um, so these have to be redone in the back here. Then that's about it. Um, Oh, the pants, too. I got to texture the pants. So that's going to be a fabric material. And I'm going to try to work in some elements of design. This uh, wave pattern. 
I'm going to try to work into the pants. Also, uh, these, I think, even though the ambient occlusion error isn't showing up right now, uh, I think I'm going to make them their own project. And, like, the threads and stuff have to be colored in there, too. Uh, so that's about it. Edgeware, chest decoration, the banner, and these threads. And I think all we're going to do on stream today is the threads. So in keeping with our trend of only doing the most boring stuff on stream, uh, that's what we're going to be doing here. So, let's see. We have to go down to Steel Dark Aged. But where's the mask? Oh, it's up here. Threads and Knots. Is it one or two? So yeah, this is the gauntlet and the shin guards, and this is the threads on the front and the back of the torso armor. So this is the back. I can identify it by these hinges for the banner hardware. Um, what we're going to do to get a better idea of... Uh, what's being covered up and what's being exposed is we're going to put in <coughs> this white fill layer so you can see just how distinct this, this is the stuff done by hand uh, that looks super good and this is the stuff that was done by the computer and the computer failed me you can see i've already redone this stuff at the top here so we're going to enter into, why am I, oh, it's saving, not responding. We're going to get into this mask. We're going to wipe these out. Why is it not doing anything? Whenever that happens, it seems like I have to add a paint layer. And there we go. So we're just going to wipe out all the stuff that the computer did. And redo it by hand. And I don't know if we're going to get to... Usually at uh, midnight I switch over to playing games. I don't know if we're going to do that today. Yeah, truth be told, I'm figuring out the process for myself as well this is probably only my second or third time uh, creating anything in substance paint so we'll be learning together uh, there's a lot of weirdness that ha that happens i have a video on how to prep models before you even bring them into substance painter because there's a lot that they don't tell you that you need to know um, and you know, they never, they never really cover when things go wrong and how you have to troubleshoot stuff. So there's a bit of that in that video too. And with the streams, there's a lot of learning what to troubleshoot. <laughs> so for example, uh, one of the things I've learned is a lot of times when you just have a black mask, you try drawing on it, nothing happens. You got to add a paint layer. And not only that, but you can't add a paint later for them up here. You have to actually right click and add paint from some reason for some reason doing that here uh doesn't give the correct results so yeah, it's all all this like little stuff that nobody would ever that nobody does think they should, but they you know don't tell you. 
like we kind of find out as we work on this together for the first time. But from here on out, it's going to be, <laughs> that's about, as far as the tutorial goes, that's about all this stream is probably going to elicit because it's just color and in. What I'm doing here, it looks like I'm painting in red. I'm not. I'm uh, painting in a mask. And the difference is that a mask will allow us to swap out colors and materials. You never really want to paint on like an actual fill layer in Substance Painter. You always want to be painting masks because then you can import and export the masks and you can swap out whatever you want into and out of the masks. So if at any point I decide, hmm, maybe I don't want red on black, maybe I want black on red, I can just switch out everything. Just swap out black for red, swap out red for black, and have an entirely different texture. And also something I learned recently is that um, Substance Painter allows you to instantiate layers. So what that means is you can have a color defined in one layer, in one texture set, and then instantiate that in every other texture set or material set. And all you have to do is go back to that original layer, swap out the color, and it will update throughout the mesh. Um, if you've used Unity, it works in a similar fashion, instantiation. Instantiation basically just means making copies that can be updated according to how you update the original. I guess one thing to make copies of something that simplifies the process, but what if you have to then change every single one of those copies by hand? You don't want to do that. So instead of creating copies, you create instances. And then once the original is updated, all the instantiations are updated as well. So you can do that with game objects in Unity, and you can do that with layers here in Substance Painter. So for example, here on the core uh, model, the core texture set, I have a layer called Bright Red. And then I instantiate this everywhere else on the model and all I have to do is update bright red to be something else like bright yellow. And the rest of the model, wherever that bright red instantiation is, will update as yellow or whatever color I choose. So that's good. Is any of the music coming through? Yeah, I was never a really adept texture artist. Yeah, it, it's uh, super helpful. You know what? I'm going to give an example. I'll show you an example of that right now. So right now we have this uh, red on black color scheme. But uh, if I change this original bright red here to in, in the properties, change that to yellow everywhere that I have that layer instantiated 
everything's going to turn yellow. And we'll just give it a second to update here. taking longer than I expected. Usually it zips on oh, quicker than this. Okay, so Apparently I don't have it instantiated for these threads and these threads. Um, but you get the idea. If you were to instantiate it for those threads, then all that would update as yellow too. And so you can, you know, work through a lot of... You don't have to guess what the color scheme would look like. You can just test it out real quick. Um, At a certain point, I'm going to probably create, instead of red on black, black on red, have it like be an alternate skin selection in the game. And it doesn't just work with mirrors, you can, or excuse me, it doesn't just work with colors, it works with materials as well. So if I wanted these to be a rougher fabric or anything that was that red color, if I wanted that to be a rougher fabric, I could apply a material to the layer too. Yeah, it's a pretty powerful feature. I mean, I was never a particularly good texture artist. And, you know, having, having the right tools makes all the difference. And like that's kind of like an important thing that I neglect to do is I I typically don't learn all the features of a, of the software I use. I usually learn ex exactly what I need to produce the results I want, and I never go beyond that, which is a mistake, you know, you should, because you don't know what you don't know, and there might always be a better way to do things, a quicker way to do things. For example, right now I'm wondering, maybe Substance Painter does a better job at baking ID maps than ZBrush does, and I'm wasting all my time painting this in by hand. Sometimes it's a trade-off. You gotta be like, well, I could spend several days looking for that, see if it does do that, learn how to do that, or I could spend you know, several hours just plowing ahead doing this by hand. So it's not going to really make a big difference for doing just one model, but, you know, if you're going to be making many models, it's, it definitely behooves you to find the best, easiest way to do that. And that's typically not by hand.
So Return of the Stoic, I take it you're looking to learn Substance Painter? What kind of modeling are you doing? I gotta update the the hands of this character are borrowed from another character I did for the no code video game development book I published with Taylor and Francis and they have their own texture set so I gotta cut and paste those textures onto the hand because right now the hands look pretty not great medieval style armor Got a couple of uh, good chainmail alphas if you want them. I'll try to link them in the description of this video once it's posted up for posterity. Actually, Substance Painter comes with a couple of good um, chainmail materials, but. Uh, I think I did a, a test and I preferred creating them in ZBrush better than I did in um, Substance Painter. I created them as a surface modifier. And usually when you apply them, they come out looking weaker than when they're pre-applied. So what I did was I reapplied them several times. And it basically bumped up the strength with each application. Yeah, uh, look for this uh, video when it's in the archives, and uh, hopefully I'll remember. If I don't, remind me. My email is admin at mikejkelly.com, K-E-L-L-E-Y. But look for this video, and hopefully in the description I'll have a link to the alphas. And just remember, if you're if you're applying them in ZBrush, to apply them and reapply them using the surface modifier. And you have to have UVs to make it look good. So basically, what you have to do is create a re, basically retopologize the armor, subdivide it, subdivide it, subdivide it, subdivide it, project all. apply then reapply and reapply it's a process <laughs> it's like the praetor distribution you know that last 20 percent of polish is really what makes or breaks the model like I really worked out over time. The secret to making this look really good was always doing the re-topology re <clears throat> again and again and again and again. Like you just can't be afraid of the work involved.
like I probably put in as much work in the retopology as I did the actual sculpting to get it to look good. I'll show you the wireframe. So that's pretty clean retopology. But the thing is like this isn't this is one of many versions of retopology so like to get the lips right on the tiger i retopologized that a couple of times and then re-sculpted on it So is the medieval style armor, is that for a video game or a hobby or a portfolio? Cool, that's how I got my start, is with mods. I modded Unreal Tournament. Not super successfully, but it was a good start. And then I created a demo video game for the book and a proof of concept video game called The Blind Shrine Maiden in which it's basically a two and a half person shooter <laughs> where you control your character through the eyes of the enemy. It's hard to explain. There's a couple of people beta testing it on YouTube. Or, I mean, there was. It's an old video game, and I. It's an old proof of concept, and I never really pursued it the way it deserved. <clears throat> This is a lot less daunting when it's the last thing you're doing on the texturing as opposed to the first. When it's the first thing you're doing, you're like, I'll never finish this. 
never ever this is really just a week's worth of texturing can you believe it I can't, I can't imagine doing this without Substance Painter. And again, the great thing is, I'm not painting in colors here. I'm painting in a mask. So I can swap out whatever color or material I want at any point. I have a whole new texture set. I'm excited to learn how to use generators too, to do like the edge wear and stuff. And then these days, rigging is made trivial. Well, 90% of the rigging can be accomplished procedurally using Mixamo online. I haven't looked at it in a while. Last I saw, though, they got rid of, like, BVH files, which is what I need for working in 3D's Max. And pairing them with the uh, motion capture that I do with my uh, 360 Connect. And some software called... I can't remember what the software is called. It's been so long since I've used it. Anyways, I have uh, videos on it. So once I finish off what's on this screen, should be almost halfway done. And the next thing I'll do is mask off, what time is it? We're already an hour into the schedule. I don't think I'm going to play video games tonight. I'll either continue working on this, masking off the pants. Or switch over to something that's kind of hold over from Side Project Saturdays, which is... I'm creating a computer mod, like literally like a hardware mod, um, I'm putting in a window, but I'm uh, basically 3D printing the grommet, so I have to create the grommet in 3D's Max. Yeah, uh... Retopple can be fun once you get good at it. Um, because, you know, making everything fit kind of becomes like a puzzle. And if you have some familiarity with, you know, tricks, it can become fun with time. Um, but rigging is something you get like immediate results with right as soon as you rig it your character starts dancing around and that's like immediately rewarding but if you haven't looked at mixamo in fact let's take a look at it now have you seen mixamo
got bought out by Adobe, I think. And they took out um, like compatibility with 3D's Max because, you know, that's not their product, I don't think. Anyways, let's let's take a look at it real quick. Hmm, this is not very helpful. Yeah, but basically, you bring your character in a uh, T pose like this, and it automates the rigging process. And then you kind of just paste in the animations. This doesn't really show the automated rigging process, which is the uh, you know biggest selling feature. Send to arrow. I don't know what that is. Oh, these are characters. You can buy characters now. Okay. But yeah, the, the automation process is super successful. And uh, then you just plug in these animations. And at one point, all the animations were free. I don't know what the deal is now. But at one point, I would highly recommend it. I'm not sure. I haven't really revisited it, revisited it recently, but I plan to. Hopefully, I'll be able to rig this character in a format that uh, I can work with. Is blocking the webcam, huh? Max Kruger, hello, welcome back. I'll show you what I've accomplished thus far off screen for the most part. Let's get rid of the wireframe. So yeah, I took all the maps I had created with just the core mesh model and uh, imported them to the project at large. And I'm pretty happy with the way things are going. Thank you. So we're back to doing the threads by hand mapping them as ID, uh, you know, ZBrush creating the ID maps didn't really work out. So we're going to finish this up and mask off the pants. We're going to learn how to do some edgeware stuff that'll be done off stream, the learning at least. And that will pretty much wrap it up. The chest decorations and the banner I have to create in a different project because they're going to require cage meshes to get them to render right. But other than that, uh, pretty much, you know, finishing up. And it's just a question of figuring out how, how to... Uh, get the 300 or so maps that have been created in Substance Painter to stack and pack into basically eight different textures. I'm not working in the dark here. There we go.
so we could have it in some working form like actually performing in a video game by May which is in keeping with the prediction I made in my blog although it's the correct month but I thought it'd be finished a year earlier <laughs> again obviously some of the delay is due to the illness but uh, what are you gonna do yeah I don't know <laughs> how many to use I currently have one for the core model so this this portion here that's blinking on and off has one UV set and then uh, the things that aren't that, that don't really need a whole lot of detail they're on a second UV set so this stuff is on a second UV set actually I think the mempo the mask part is with the core and then the stuff that requires a lot of detail like the chest decoration and the banner are on a third UV set and I'm hoping I can use some sort of te uh, texture atlasing s software to merge them all together because in theory that's what texture atlasing does in practice I really haven't pursued it yet well and also he has a, f a flintlock pistol that has its own UV set For performance issues, you always want um, just one texture set. So if it's going to be in a video game, you pretty much got to get it down to one texture set for performance issues. And again, I think that can be accomplished through texture atlasing. Having multiple texture sets, or multiple UV sets anyways, allows me to kind of better manage the resolution of each mesh part. Yeah. When I create UVs, I usually, like, uh, for the layout, and the scaling, I usually automate that process. There's usually a button in any software package that scales them proportionally to each other and then packs them, uh, you know, f with perfect op optimization that a human couldn't, couldn't achieve. Um, and hopefully that processes available in texture atlasing as well so i'm kind of going out on a limb not having any experience with that and just assuming that it'll work when i get to that point <clears throat> alternately it will go into the game with uh three different texture sets if necessary and it'll just take a performance hit but this is a pretty, it's going to be a pretty simple game. I mean, it's kind of modeled after one finger death punch. So it's not like an open world. And you're not going to be running into like, you know, a dozen characters at once. And the background is going to be pretty static. So... I hate to say that performance won't be as much of an issue, but because uh, you are, as a developer, you're always supposed to take that into consideration. But it 
Yeah, it's a bit of a balancing act in any event. There's always trade-offs. Like everything is going to be some sort of compromise and you have to just decide what you're prioritizing and then commit to that. It looks weird with nobody. So currently I have three, uh, well, four, including the flintlock pistol, four UV sets. And hopefully I can get that down to one through atlasing. Is it saving? Why is this popping up in my way? You can't see it, but there's a brush window here blocking my view. Yeah, in, I mean, basically I have some of my UVs here stacked. So, for example, this shoulder armor piece, there's going to be four of these pieces, one, two, three, four, all the way down his arm. They're going to be completely identical. And when I copy this, essentially I'll be copying out three or four more identi identical UV coordinates, but they'll be stacked on top of each other. Now, that would be an issue if I wanted to like individualize each plate with like scratches or dents or something. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. So essentially by copying the meshes at what is going on here? By copying out the meshes, I'm also copying and stacking the UVs. It saves me a little bit of work. And at a later, at a later date too, if I do decide to differentiate them, then I can just in like 3D's Max, select their UV coordinates and move them around. And I can also move around what I've already painted and then just add the scratches and the dents to the individual plates. I don't know if I'm going to go that far though. But it's, it's nice to have that option. And again, some of that depends on the texture atlasing working properly. Uh, in a lot of cases, I kind of wish I had done more more of that like from the elbow down the gauntlets the bracelets the hands all of that is identical left and right so i i could have just overlapped those two and painted it once rather than having to paint everything twice Yeah, and then of course you always feel guilty about cutting corners too, but it's a lot of times art becomes like a Zeno paradox where you you can't finish it without cutting corners. Zeno paradox is basically you can turn a room walking to one end of a room to another end of a room or from one side of a room to another side of a room you can make that an infinite journey simply by only walking halfway each time so you walk halfway across the room and then you w walk the remaining different 
distance halfway and then you walk the remaining distance half, halfway, you'll never reach the other side. Um, and sometimes the mission creep of art works in the same way. And the only way to get to the other side of the room is not by walking to the other side of the room, but by moving the other side of the room closer to you. And in this analogy, that's cutting corners. At a certain point, you just have to say, I'm, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that. I have to finish. Because perfection is the enemy of progress, right? It's the same with moving. <laughs> like it seems like if you've ever packed for a move, it seems like the more you pack, the more that's left to pack. Yeah. <laughs> Entire college career, yeah. Yeah, I was fond of saying, I went to Buff State, I was fond of saying nobody actually ever graduates from Buff State. It's more of an escape. You had to escape college. Yeah, absolutely. And I've had people uh, send me emails too. Email me at admin at mikejkelly.com. Send me your work. I'd love to see it. link in the comments and uh, send it to my email admin at mikejkelly.com k-e-l-l-e-y Cool, cool. This has become less tiresome and more therapeutic. I'm kind of uh, in a state of Zen-like acceptance that this is my life now. I just paint the reds. By the way, Max, I was showing a Return of the Stoic um, that you can instantiate layers in substance. I'm not sure how common that knowledge is, but I want to make a point of telling everybody about it because it's pretty cool. It's one of the more powerful features of Substance Painter. And what that means is basically you create a layer anywhere in your project you know, assign it a color, assign it a uh, texture, a material, smart material, whatever. And you can instantiate it in any of the texture sets you want, in all of the texture sets if you want. And when you update the original, any way, anywhere you have that instantiation, it updates. So I've made a point of instantiating this red color throughout my texture sets. And if I want to switch it over to yellow to see how that looks, I can switch, you know, everything that I've painted this red color into a yellow color.
And because I want to like make textures available for DLC for the, the game, that'll simplify the process. I can just swap in colors, swap them out. And that way it also becomes more affordable, you know, to the end user because I'm not spending hours repainting everything. Yeah. Like you should have seen me before Substance Painter. I was not a texture artist. <laughs> but it gives you like superhuman like texturing abilities. That'd be probably one of the sadder superpowers. You're not save, saving Lois Lane with that. And then similarly, uh, you know, it's important to point out that I'm not actually painting anything red. I'm just creating masks so I can swap in any color, swap in any smart material. And add procedural effects too. Oh. Can you just attach it as a, oh, for the link you did. Yeah, okay. I get it. What kind of hardware do you use? Do you have a tablet? I'm using a Yaya Nova monitor tablet thing. And I'm very happy with it. It's uh, much, much cheaper than Wacom. Nice. The one thing I like about Wacom's is they have like that uh, paper texture feel. Um, the Yaya Novas don't have that. The monitor is, you know, feels a bit slippery. This also has My desk is such a mess right now. It also has a kind of like an attachment where you can like program buttons. It's not built into the monitor. It's like uh, the monitor itself has a USB port and you plug it into that and it's got suction cups. So it's pretty inelegant in terms of like attaching it to the monitor. 
I plan on creating a uh, uh, DIY version of it that's more elegant. Eleven thirty. Uh, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to take a quick break. And then I'll be right back at it. Thank you very much. I'll be back in a moment.
forgot to throw up the be right back image. Oh well. I'll get better at this. Sorry about running off so quickly. Uh, I always feel rude doing that. I got some chips and some cola. I guess it would be better if I brought the microphone down here, huh? So I'm going to chomp some of these into the microphone. Yeah, I guess that's a good thing about the lack of texture on the Yayanovas. I've never worn out a nib. I have a Surface Pro 7, and it's garbage. I, I got rid of my Surface Pro 4, which was perfectly serviceable, in many ways better than the 7. Basically because it had a USB-C port and that allowed me to add a second monitor with uh, less cords, which seems like a ridiculous reason to like upgrade. But um, I spent a lot of time in the hospital and I wanted to be able to stream from the hospital. And uh, there's really only so many cables. You, I, every time I go to the hospital, every time I go to the Cancer Institute, I, uh, I have like a, a bag with me with all the essentials in, in case they're going to admit me right then and there. Because nobody's, my family isn't like overly concerned about like bringing me the stuff I need. They offer a lot of time, but... Anyways, so I have to kind of lighten the load of my daily carry to and from the hospital. And the 7. The 4 was great. I love the 4. And the 7, the, the biggest issue I have right now, I use, what's it called? Pro Tablet? It's software that allows you to add buttons uh, to the screen, like touch buttons. So like, you know how in ZBrush you need Alt? You need to press down Alt to like move things around and navigate. Well, this software allows you to add custom buttons Alt being one of them. And the first column of buttons, it doesn't work. Like, half the time you press it and it just doesn't respond. If you touch it with the pen, it responds. But, of course, what you need to be doing is using your thumb. Your left thumb while you have your pen in your right hand. And it's so frustrating that you spend, you know, what, $1,200 for the tablet? 
and then the software on top of it and and it, nothing works like you literally can't navigate the software that is the whole reason you bought the tablet for so and i don't know you know if i were to approach the software uh creator he'd say it was a microsoft problem and microsoft would blame the software vendor so yeah it's like such a small thing but it completely invalidates twelve hundred dollars worth of hardware like it's 2021 can't we can't things work <laughs> haven't we learned how to make things work But back in the day, I had like a Wacom tablet tablet, like not the monitor type, like just like one of those $70 tablets. And I took an Arduino and set it up to behave like a keyboard and add buttons to it and glued that to the side of the tablet. And it was super effective. So I'm thinking of doing that with a, a similar... Uh, set up with my Yaya Nova monitor tablet here with uh, using the added magic of 3D printing. I have an old, old video on my other YouTube channel showing how to program the Arduino to act as a keyboard. And all the special codes you needed to activate certain keys. I wonder if it's still up there. But yeah, it was pretty awesome. Uh, 3D printer, CR10. Probably sounds like I'm rich. I have all this, you know, great stuff. Not all of it is mine. Some of it is loaned to me from people I'm doing odd jobs for, just helping them out. Friends who have, because uh, I used to work overseas, so I made friends overseas, and rather than put things in storage, sometimes they lend it to me. You've got a couple printers? Which ones? I like the CR10, especially because of the print volume, the bed volume. I had a Tronxy XY3, but the motherboard died, and I bought like a off-brand main board and couldn't figure out how to hook up some of the wires. So I wasn't able to repair it. It's just kind of languishing in storage yeah cr10 is is uh very nice i think what i'm gonna do is at midnight i'm gonna switch over to my side projects uh saturday stuff i'm uh, doing a computer upgrade slash uh, mod like i said creating a window for it and i'm 3d printing the grommet so I think I'll switch over to doing that at midnight. I guess start a load of laundry too. I'm going into the cancer cancer institute tomorrow. If you go to my website nicholsiapixels dot com, I have a bunch of uh, what do I have up there? Let's look. I have a bunch of free 3D printed stuff. I forget exactly what. I'm going to switch over to my left monitor here. So this is the website. Um, here's the shop. Hmm, I didn't know it gotta redo this stuff 
So I've got a, a Blade Runner Frank Lloyd Wright type USB organizer. Uh, I sell these on Etsy too, but the, the files are free. I have a drive drawer. This is the worst picture ever, but basically you can store two Western Digital um, passports and a CD drive up top. And it, and it slides out on a tray. Cable management there and another cable management wiring drawer. I got to put some more stuff up here. I got a bunch of stuff. A lot of it's cable management. <laughs> Back to Substance Painter. We're almost done with the threads. Oops, I hit Control Z too many times. Yeah, all the all the files there are free to download, so. I'll put some more up eventually. <laughs> Where do you work? If you don't mind my asking. I'd like to get into IT and, and security in particular. I wonder if Return of the Stoic, are you still there with us? I hope so. Hmm. I have a... Uh, somewhat dim view of everything medical <laughs> given my personal experience with doctors and hospitals is this the last thread <gasps> yep, oh, that was done by hand. This was done by hand, too, but some of it's a little sloppy. Actually, I only see one that's not really finished. Look at that. We're done with threads. It's a joyous, joyous occasion. The thing about Substance Painter is you got to move the light around because you're always missing something. <laughs> whoop, whoop. say we're done with threads and then I spend some time kind of touching them up here. Egos, yeah. I used to work, uh, I was an adjunct professor at SUNY Fredonia and uh, universities are a Especially toxic. Like the students there were more coddled than 
what I was used to working with uh, in terms of like kindergartners in Korea. And then even more childish than the students were the other professors. So I was able to escape from there, thankfully. Yeah, I can see that. By extension, people are always telling you that they are right. Yeah. I have to remind myself of all my past jobs uh, whenever I complain about like having to color. <laughs> Alright, so that looks good. Let's get rid of this fill layer. Back in black. Save it. Yeah, sometimes tradition is good and sometimes it's just kind of like a barrier to the future. Sorry, I'm going to mute the crunching. <laughs> Yeah, I'm using a uh, material called Steel Aged Dark. And hold on a second. Is there somebody at the door? Uh, steel Aged Dark. And I found that if you mess around with the color properties, you pick up a real nice shiny tint. So like I made it black and uh, tinted red and you can it's most prominent kind of in the gauntlet there so that was a happy little discovery there yeah i'm usually not super happy with uh, a lot of the you know stuff I've, I've done uh, like sometimes it takes a little bit of convincing I have to convince myself it's good but I feel like this is genuinely good as my headset falls off thank you
It'll be interesting. To see it once all the armor is uh, filled out, you know. Once I have the, the, the plates that need repeating, once those are repeated throughout the the arm and around the waist and stuff too. And then of course, I mean, basically you get a couple of different reveals as you're working on it, you know. When you're sculpting, you're like, yeah, okay, that's good. Uh, but you you don't get to see it pop um, until you, like you add the textures and substance painter, and then it's like a whole new thing. And then you animate it, and it's like a whole new thing again. So that's kind of nice. Like it kind of renews and rebirths, and so it's uh, constantly new to you. You don't get bored of it. Part of the disease is uh, I get the this debilitating like full body cramping, and uh, it's coming on to the point where like my hands are stopping working. Animation is great because that's kind of where everything starts to pay off. Like the reason we have three D is because. None of it is easier than 2D until you get to the point of animation. Animating in 3D is a lot faster, a lot... The reward is immediate. Like, that's where all the hard work in 3D pays off, is once you get to the animation process. And uh, it's not particularly... I mean, at this point, you can set up a mocap. I mean, for for years now, like going back to as soon as like they had software for the um, Connect, you could set up a mocap studio at home. And I actually have a video on that. And then you don't even have to be an animator. You can just act out the the animations and plug them into the skeleton. But I have an old video on, uh, I can't even remember the software. Let me look it up. <laughs> on YouTube, it says I'm streaming Jurassic Park Evolution Claire Sanctuary. Oh, is that because it's midnight? Yeah, I haven't really messed around with facial capture yet. This is an old video. I pie soft. Yeah, they they um, donated the software to me uh, in exchange for making a video, and this is dating back to 2014. And this is from this is from the uh, 3D the Connect. So 
So yeah, I have a. I still have a connect. I still have access to the software. So I'm gonna probably act out some stuff for the Tiger Samurai too. Sorry, I'm seeing if I can uh, outweigh my hand and see if uh, it comes back to working functionally. And I don't think it is. I think I'm going to... Yeah, because again, that's going back to like 2014. And he gets, you get pretty clean animation from that too. You got to obviously do some cleanup, but um, for it, it's indispensable for any indie studio. All right, uh, my hand is uh, deciding not to play along. It's done for the day, and so I think I'm going to call. It quits here at 12. I don't think I'm going to switch over to um, the side project Saturday or any gaming. I'm just going to call it there. I keep forgetting I got to do the pants. I got to do the pants later. Probably Thursday. I think uh, I think what I'll do is tomorrow I'll learn how to add edgeware. I'll I'll dedicate Wednesday to studying, learning how to do edgeware and learning how to apply patterns to the texture sets here. All right. Uh, yep. Have fun at work, and uh, I hope to see you Thursday. Cool. Take it easy. Hope to see you then. Bye now. Bye.